英語聞き流しリスニング、英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロード、その他の物語はホームページからお聞きいただけます。88thpp.com 88thpp.com 5th June Dear Daddy Long Legs Your secretary man has just written to me saying that Mr. Smith prefers that I should not accept Mrs. McBride's invitation, but should return to Lock Willow the same as last summer. Why, 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 Daddy? You don't understand about it. Mrs. McBride does want me, really and truly. I'm not the least bit of trouble in the house. I'm a help. They don't take up many servants, and Sally and I can do lots of useful things. It's a fine chance for me to learn housekeeping. Every woman ought to understand it, and I only know asylum keeping. There aren't any girls our age at the camp, and Mrs. McBride wants me for a companion for Sally. We are planning to do a lot of reading together. We are going to read all of the books for next year's English and sociology. The professor said it would be a great help if we would get our reading finished in the summer, and it's so much easier to remember it if we read together and talk it over. Just to live in the same house with Sally's mother is an education. She's the most interesting, entertaining, companionable, charming woman in the world. She knows everything. Think how many summers I've spent with Mrs. Lippett and how I'll appreciate the contrast. You needn't be afraid that I'll be crowding them, for their house is made of rubber. When they have a lot of company, they just sprinkle tents about in the woods and turn the boys outside. It's going to be such a nice, healthy summer exercising out of doors every minute. Jimmy McBride is going to teach me how to ride horseback and paddle a canoe, and how to shoot and, oh, lots of things I ought to know. It's the kind of nice, jolly, carefree time that I've never had, and I think every girl deserves it once in her life. Of course I'll do exactly as you say, but please, please let me go, Daddy. I've never wanted anything so much. This isn't Jerusha Abbott, the future great author, writing to you. It's just Judy, a girl. 9th June Mr. John Smith. Sir, yours of the 7th inst. At hand. In compliance with the instructions received through your secretary, I leave on Friday next to spend the summer at Lock Willow Farm. I hope always to remain. Miss Jerusha Abbott. Lock Willow Farm. 3rd August. Dear Daddy Long Legs. It has been nearly two months since I wrote, which wasn't nice of me, I know, but I haven't loved you much this summer. You see, I'm being frank. You can't imagine how disappointed I was at having to give up the McBride's camp. Of course, I know that you're my guardian, and that I have to regard your wishes in all matters, but I couldn't see any reason. It was so distinctly the best thing that could have happened to me. If I had been Daddy, and you had been Judy, I should have said, Bless you, my child, run along and have a good time, see lots of new people and learn lots of new things, live out of doors, and get strong and well and rested for a year of hard work. But not at all. Just a curt line from your secretary ordering me to. Lock Willow. It's the impersonality of your commands that hurts my feelings. It seems as though, if you felt the tiniest little bit for me the way I feel for you, you'd sometimes send me a message that you'd written with your own hand, instead of those beastly typewritten secretary's notes. If there were the slightest hint that you cared, I'd do anything on earth to please you. I know that I was to write nice, long, detailed letters without ever expecting any answer. You're living up to your side of the bargain, I'm being educated, and I suppose you're thinking I'm not living up to mine. But, Daddy, it is a hard bargain. It is, really. I'm so awfully lonely. You are the only person I have to care for, and you are so shadowy. You're just an imaginary man that I've made up, and probably the real you isn't a bit like my imaginary you. But you did once, When I was ill in the infirmary, send me a message, and now, when I am feeling awfully forgotten, I get out your card and read it over. I don't think I am telling you at all what I started to say, which was this. Although my feelings are still hurt, for it is very humiliating to be picked up and moved about by an arbitrary, peremptory, unreasonable, omnipotent, invisible providence, still, when a man has been as kind and generous and thoughtful as you have heretofore been towards me, I suppose he has a right to be an arbitrary, peremptory, unreasonable, invisible providence if he chooses, and so, I'll forgive you and be cheerful again. But I still don't enjoy getting Sally's letters about the good times they are having in camp. However, we will draw a veil over that and begin again. 
I've been writing and writing this summer, four short stories finished and sent to four different magazines. So you see I'm trying to be an author. I have a workroom fixed in a corner of the attic where Master Jervie used to have his rainy day playroom. It's in a cool, breezy corner with two dormer windows, and shaded by a maple tree with a family of red squirrels living in a hole. I'll write a nicer letter in a few days and tell you all the farm news. We need rain. Yours as ever. Judy. 10th August. Mr. Daddy Longlegs. Sir, I address you from the second crotch in the willow tree by the pool in the pasture. There's a frog croaking underneath, a locust singing overhead and two little devil down heads darting up and down the trunk. I've been here for an hour, it's a very comfortable crotch, especially after being upholstered with two sofa cushions. I came up with a pen and tablet hoping to write an immortal short story, but I've been having a dreadful time with my heroine, I can't make her behave as I want her to behave, so I've abandoned her for the moment, and am writing to you. Not much relief though, for I can't make you behave as I want you to, either. If you are in that dreadful New York, I wish I could send you some of this lovely, breezy, sunshiny outlook. The country is heaven after a week of rain. Speaking of heaven, do you remember Mr. Kellogg that I told you about last summer? The minister of the little white church at the corners. Well, the poor old soul is dead, last winter of pneumonia. I went half a dozen times to hear him preach and got very well acquainted with his theology. He believed to the end exactly the same things he started with. It seems to me that a man who can think straight along for 47 years without changing a single idea ought to be kept in a cabinet as a curiosity. I hope he is enjoying his harp and golden crown, he was so perfectly sure of finding them. There's a new young man, very consequential, in his place. The congregation is pretty dubious, especially the faction led by Deacon Cummings. It looks as though there was going to be an awful split in the church. We don't care for innovations in religion in this neighborhood. During our week of rain I sat up in the attic and had an orgy of reading, Stevenson, mostly. He himself is more entertaining than any of the characters in his books, I dare say he made himself into the kind of hero that would look well in print. Don't you think it was perfect of him to spend all the $10,000 his father left, for a yacht, and go sailing off to the South Seas? He lived up to his adventurous creed. If my father had left me $10,000, I'd do it, too. The thought of Valima makes me wild. I want to see the tropics. I want to see the whole world. I'm going to be a great author or artist or actress or playwright, or whatever sort of a great person I turn out to be. I have a terrible wander thirst, the very sight of a map makes me want to put on my hat and take an umbrella and start. I shall see before I die the palms and temples of the South. Thursday evening at twilight, sitting on the doorstep. Very hard to get any news into this letter. Judy is becoming so philosophical of late, that she wishes to discourse largely of the world in general, instead of descending to the trivial details of daily life. But if you must have news, here it is. Our nine young pigs waded across the brook and ran away last Tuesday, and only eight came back. We don't want to accuse anyone unjustly, but we suspect that Widow Doubt has one more than she ought to have. Mr. Weaver has painted his barn and his two silos of bright pumpkin yellow, a very ugly color but he says it will wear. The Brewers have company this week, Mrs. Brewer's sister and two nieces from Ohio. One of our Rhode Island Reds only brought off three chicks out of 15 eggs. We can't imagine what was the trouble. Rhode Island. Reds, in my opinion, are a very inferior breed. I prefer buff. Orpingtons. The new clerk in the post office at Bonnerig Four Corners drank every drop of Jamaica ginger they had in stock, seven dollars worth, before he was discovered. Old Ira Hatch has rheumatism and can't work anymore, he never saved his money when he was earning good wages, so now he has to live on the town. There's to be an ice cream social at the schoolhouse next Saturday evening. Come and bring your families. I have a new hat that I bought for 25 cents at the post office. This is my latest portrait, on my way to rake the hay. It's getting too dark to see, anyway, the news is all used up. Good night. Judy. Friday. Good morning. Here is some news. What do you think? You never, never, never guess who's coming to Lock Willow. A letter to Mrs. Semple from Mr. Pendleton. He's motoring through the Berkshires, and is tired and wants to rest on a nice quiet farm, if he climbs out at her doorstep some night will she have a room ready for him? 
Maybe he'll stay one week, or maybe two, or maybe three. He'll see how restful it is when he gets here. Such a flutter as we are in. The whole house is being cleaned and all the curtains washed. I'm driving to the corners this morning to get some new oilcloth for the entry, and two cans of brown floor paint for the hall and back stairs. Mrs. Dowd is engaged to come tomorrow to wash the windows, in the exigency of the moment, we waive our suspicions in regard to the piglet. You might think, from this account of our activities, that the house was not already immaculate, but I assure you it was. Whatever Mrs. Semple's limitations, she is a housekeeper. But isn't it just like a man, Daddy? He doesn't give the remotest hint as to whether he will land on the doorstep today, or two weeks from today. We shall live in a perpetual breathlessness until he comes, and if he doesn't hurry, the cleaning mail have to be done over again. There's Amasai waiting below with the buckboard and Grover. I drive alone, but if you could see Old Grove, you wouldn't be worried as to my safety. With my hand on my heart, farewell. Judy. P.S. Isn't that a nice ending? I got it out of Stevenson's letters. Saturday. Good morning again. I didn't get this enveloped yesterday before the postman came, so I'll add some more. We have one mail a day at 12 o'clock. Rural delivery is a blessing to the farmers. Our postman not only delivers letters, but he runs errands for us in town, at five cents an errand. Yesterday he brought me some shoestrings and a jar of cold cream, I sunburned all the skin off my nose before I got my new hat, and a blue Windsor tie and a bottle of blacking all for ten cents. That was an unusual bargain owing to the largeness of my order. Also he tells us what is happening in the great world. Several people on the route take daily papers, and he reads them as he jogs along, and repeats the news to the ones who don't subscribe. So in case a war breaks out between the United States and Japan, or the president is assassinated, or Mr. Rockefeller leaves a million dollars to the John Greer home, you needn't bother to write, I'll hear it anyway. No sign yet of Master Jervy. But you should see how clean our house is, and with what anxiety we wipe our feet before we step in. I hope you'll come soon, I am longing for someone to talk to. Mrs. Semple, to tell you the truth, gets rather monotonous. She never lets ideas interrupt the easy flow of her conversation. It's a funny thing about the people here. Their world is just this single hilltop. They are not a bit universal, if you know what I mean. It's exactly the same as at the John Greer home. Our ideas there were bounded by the four sides of the iron fence, only I didn't mind it so much because I was younger, and was so awfully busy. By the time I'd got all my beds made and my baby's faces washed and had gone to school and come home and had washed their faces again and darned their stockings and mended Freddie Perkins's trousers, he tore them every day of his life, and learned my lessons in between, I was ready to go to bed, and I didn't notice any lack of social intercourse. But after two years in a conversational college, I do miss it and I shall be glad to see somebody who speaks my language. I really believe I've finished, Daddy. Nothing else occurs to me at the moment, I'll try to write a longer letter next time. Yours always. Judy. P.S. The lettuce hasn't done it all well this year. It was so dry early in the season.